I am Bill Cortright with Living Right with Bill Cortright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am Bill Cortright. And today I am here with a special guest. His name is Dave Conley. And Dave has been a guest on the show uh, in the past, but Dave is going to be introducing us to his soon-to-be-released book called Midlife Magic. Dave is a speaker, author, transformational coach, and a former tech executive and a former 330-pound man. How you doing, Dave? (laughs) Thank you, Bill. And friend. We will say and, and good friend. Yes, so very, you. very good friend. <laughs> I, so this week, our topic is dealing with crisis. And yeah. I wanted to have you on because the research you've been doing these last few years, and I've known you for a few years now, mm-hmm. and the research that you're doing on the midlife crisis or the so-called midlife crisis. Yeah. And I like one of your quotes, and I kind of want to take it from there. You had a quote. Yeah. You said, wine and cheese aren't the only thing that get better with age. <laughs> we do too. The clincher is we have to choose it. Yes. Would you like to elaborate on what is midlife crisis? Oh, thank you. Uh, so midlife, midlife crisis. And, yes. and um, you, it, unavoidable, unavoidable in that um, world over, uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis actually did this. The economists did this. They did this, this um, international survey. It says that uh, a midlife is the lowest point in our lives over and over again. And it's not just in the United States. It's world over, 187 com- countries. Somewhere between the ages of 39 and 52, people say, this sucks. Ooh. So the question is, why? Yes. Why do you feel like this? And we'll call it the midlife crisis. And we make these jokes about it, you know, like, oh, boob jobs and nose jobs and running away with the pool boy and the rest of it. Yet those jokes do hide some real changes that people must do at this point in their lives so that they live this really big second half of life. And so- I'm sorry, Dave. What would you term though a midlife crisis? What would you, what, 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 what does it look like though? What is- so, because because uh, I don't know, I bought a red Corvette. Was I in a midlife crisis? I don't think yes. so. I was. Maybe. That's a definitely I so. right. No, yeah, yeah. But I'm I mean that's the that's the joke, right? Like then you buy people, a sports car, right? So what what does that look like to you? Ah, what, got what, it. What is it? It's um, it's when your internal and external world things start happening to you. And your life feels like it's shifting out of control. So like um more, a lot of people say that the moment that they have to put on reading glasses is the moment where they're like, oh, I feel old. Or uh, putting on weight. Um, often it's also the time that you have your first chronic illness, maybe even go on medication for those chronic illnesses. And then externally, uh, kids are getting older, your relationships, your major relationships start to um, change. Um, And then finally, it's really the recognition that this is a finite life. More than any other time in your life, you go, holy crap, I'm going to die. And is this all there is? What is my legacy? What says I was here? So it's the internal changes, the external changes, Mm -hmm. then the desire for legacy. And I believe that that's that energy. All of that leads to that energy of change. And when it's misdirected, that's chaos. That's crisis. Mm-hmm. And so it, when they, and when it, I always say out of chaos comes change, right? There's yeah, a, absolutely. There's a reason that they're feeling this uh, crisis. And like you said, nobody escapes it, mm-hmm. right? Nobody escapes this, right? So what are some of the, the things that they're feeling in crisis? Are they, are they, are they, I know their health is one thing, but does, is this where the vocation changes or the the relationships change. Where does where does a change happen when that midlife starts? What that you've seen with your clients and things. More often than not, people um, uh, see it and feel it um, the most in their health. 
um, okay. with, with so much of their health mm-hmm. just changing out from underneath them. Um, it's, it's putting on the weight, it's the chronic illness, it's the rest of it. And it's with those other things that happen too. I, I, if in your job, you're going to top out. Um, it's, it, this isn't a time where you're, you're, you're going up and up and up anymore. Uh, unless somebody dies, unless somebody, um, you know, or unless you create your own job, uh, this is the time when, uh, when people often uh, change, change their mm-hmm. professions, change their careers, or uh, because they're topped out. And this internal versus, versus external, we talk a lot about this in, in levels of change, is that um, you uh, have often uh, had most of your job life satisfaction in what you do right? Your external mm-hmm. validation comes from your job, right? You're, you're paid for it. You're, you're praised for it. You, you bring that money home and you do something with it. And it's not until you start shifting that around to say, okay, do I want to have that external validation from my job, which may not be going all that well right now. And in particular with a lot of people losing their jobs, right? Um, it may not be going all that well for you. How are you going to internally, uh, fortify yourself and really shift the, the direction from external satisfaction to internal satisfaction. Who are you on the inside that makes you this good person? And I could see, like you said, one of the first things that happens in midlife crisis is your health. And I could see yeah. how your health would affect your energy, would affect your career. It'll affect everything. your relationship. It'll affect, like you said, it'll affect everything. So well, think about it. I, I mean, it's, it, unless you're taking care of yourself, mm-hmm. your body's going to say, here, hold my beer. I'm going to screw you up. And you will have <laughs> to pay attention to it, right? Yes. You know, like suddenly you're like, oh, crap, you know. And midlife is the time where, where uh, people often, um, as my doctor told me, he's like, look, you know, uh, you're going to get heart disease. One of the big three, heart disease, cancer, or stroke, right? Those are the ones that get us. And often in midlife, you are going to touch on one of those. Uh, and that's when people start saying, I've got to make a change. And that's where the centerpiece of health comes in. And that's where, so you talk and, and I, and I've heard you speak and, and with your clients, you talk about the halves, right? Midlife is the, you got to then think about the second half of your life. Yeah. What does a good second half of life entail? Then what Mm. is that shift that has to take place? Because out of this crisis, you can either sink or you can grow. Exactly. What are your thoughts? Can you explain that a little bit? What do you mean by second half? This really good second half is about understanding that, one, you have choice, right? So many people like build this cage and you talk about the cage of your own making. And, you know, like I can't, I won't, I don't because of all of these other things. And so flipping that to can, will, and do, right? It's this, this choice, this agency. It's that choice is saying that you always have that choice, just expanding your menu to that can and will and do. I, I, sometimes I, I, I regret bringing up who this is because of who this is, but it's Jeff Bezos. And I can't say, yeah. besides Amazon and, and getting stuff during a pandemic, he really changed my thinking. And he talked about it in the stance of business but I think about it for life. He talks about living a regret-free, uh, uh, making regret-free decisions. I take that as living a regret-free life. And this regret-free life is knowing that regrets are just delayed decisions. Mm, very, very good. That's good. A delayed decision means yeah. that the only regret that you can possibly have is the regret on your deathbed when you can't do anything about it. Right. So until that moment, all of these regrets are just delayed decisions. So, so if somebody is stuck in this midlife crisis and they're in this chaos, what are the practices that they have to start to get out of it? How do you, how do you get out of it? Because a lot mm. of people, they get stuck into it and they think they can buy their way out. That's the red right. bed. I had to get the car, right. okay? <laughs> okay. And that car made you feel good for a little bit, right? Like, you, do you still have that car? I still, well, actually, when I was 50, 52, you said, right? Yeah. So I, I had a silver Corvette then. <laughs> <laughs> so, just so you know, I still got the red one. 
And I'm being ready to buy the blue one soon. <laughs> but I, I just. Yeah, but that's not crisis now. Now no, it's I don't, like I don't a car you love. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I had my crisis though. My crisis was, was more career because mm, I really, yep. I, I'm not one. I like to build things and then move on. And I, that's really where, where mine came. But what do, you, what do you think? What are the practices to get somebody out of crisis? My acronym is SEEN. S-E-E-N. Practices are really straightforward. Sleep. Because if you don't have your sleep yep. dialed in, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. And sleep is the one place where we learn from a very early age how to steal from it, how to screw it up, how to, how to manipulate it in order to live like the rest of our lives. Sleep, I'm telling you, the, the people that I work with, the people that I talk to, just about everyone I talk to, has something going on with their sleep. Uh, eating. Now, eating is, is you, you know what? There are ways to eat and there are, there are ways not to eat. I, I um, really, really don't advocate, and we talk about this all the time, you and I, Bill. Um, I really don't advocate that there's one way to eat uh, because of all of our uniqueness, my microbiome, my genetics, my, all of the things that make us you. There are different ways to eat that fully support. Um, the only thing we know for absolute certain is that sugar will kill you, right? You know, that, yeah. that, that we yes. know absolutely yes. certain. But, every, but otherwise, eating is about getting to your health goals uh, in a way that is sustainable in a way of life. Exercise, movement. You know, we, we spend most of our time. We didn't, we didn't evolve for a million years, as I sit here, into, right. into world-class sitting machines. We were right. always moving, right? It's only been in the last few hundred years where we've actually been you know, sitting on our ass. It's about exercise and adding movement into our daily lives. And then noticing, S-E-E-N, noticing. That is being in the present, in the present moment. Mindfulness, meditation, right. or a dozen different ways in order to, see, to, to be in the, in the moment and not being stuck in this world of a past you can't change or a future you can't even predict. I mean, I don't even know what I'm having for lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, but the scene, sleeping, eating, exercise, and noticing. That's excellent. Now, let's talk a little bit about your life. Am I allowed yeah. to? <laughs> okay, yeah, so, I, hey, so your show, talk, absolutely. That's my show, right? Let's yeah. talk about your midlife crisis a little bit because yeah. you come from a very, very high tech, you are a high tech executive. Yeah. Very, very, you know, high level type guy. Mm -hmm. And when people, a lot of, and I've heard this and maybe I'm going to see what you say with your clients is that you'll get clients that are really, they're in midlife and they're in crisis and they're really unhappy with their life, but they uh -huh. have this fear. They have such a fear of security and yeah. they've been working for security that they're afraid to step outside that. Do you see that also? hundred percent. I mean, the, the practices that will keep us stuck the most are the fear of change. I, I, um, it, th that is the thing that keeps people stuck the most is that they're like, Oh my God, you know, I feel the safest right here, right now. And I can't even imagine, I may dream about something different, but the thing that's going to keep me stuck the most is the fear of that change made up reality or no reality. It's the fear of change. It keeps you sick. It keeps you unhappy. It keeps you unhealthy. All of those things conspire together to make the rest of it worse. You know, it's like if you, if you have a crappy relationship, if you have like a job that's not satisfying, if you have a community that you want better, start by looking in the mirror because Always. that's where it is, right? Yeah. You know, that's exactly where it is. And for me, yeah, let's hear your I, story, Dave. I had, I, I did. I mean, on, on the outside, I had everything that everyone else, all the Joneses keep, I kept up with all of them and I, I blew past them. I had, I had the, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars of budget. I had, you know, hundreds of people working for me. I had uh, just, I had, I had invented along with a, a small group of people, the entire consumer internet. You know, like if you, right. if you got on, on online in the nineties, you probably use the software we built at AOL. Uh, and I continue that. And yet I was miserable. I was absolutely miserable. And I had a friend ask me, it's like, well, when were you happiest? And I'm like, well, it was that early days in AOL. And as I'd been kicked up in, 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 in my career, I got further and further away from the one thing that mattered the most to me, which was people. 
You know, I was, I was, I was, I, I had people working for me, but I didn't feel like I was making a difference in individual people's lives. And that's what turned into my change of like, okay, what am I going to do about this? So I quit that job, started up, uh, you know, got back into entrepreneurship. And then, you know, as you know, the story, maybe I told it on here last time, uh, you know, my wife, well, please, we have a me. lot of new listeners. Tell them your story, <laughs> Dave, because yeah. Carol, my, yes. my beautiful wife of 13 years, very happy in my relationship. She passed unexpectedly within a few hours. She went from healthy to not healthy to gone. And here I was in the, the job that I didn't like, um, losing the love of my life, uh, and was completely grief stricken. And I weighed 330 pounds and I smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. And I was, a dis- I was well on my way to my own uh, early death. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started this, uh, started a long journey uh, and mm-hmm. a journey that I help others with of really learning to love myself, learning to love myself as much as I loved Carol. And this was new for me. You know, it's like I, I, I'd received all of that, all those accolades from my job or uh, from my relationship. It was really about bringing it back to me. And so over the course of a few years, uh, I lost 150 pounds, quit smoking, and completely uh, restructured my entire life. I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. I uh, uh, revolutionized my my health and really changed how I think about my world so that I could begin this journey of living just a kick-ass midlife. I love my midlife, right? Like, Like midlife is such a magical time. And now I help other people uh, with rebooting their lives, particularly from crisis. And especially when you, when you work with, because you're a, a top level coach, right? And yeah. you work with these people that come in and they're all stressed out. Mm-hmm. They're all imbalanced. What is, mm-hmm. So if I asked you, so crisis, right? Whether it's midlife crisis or any type of crisis, what are the changes in thinking that can help anybody reboot during a crisis? Because- mm. What is the first thing you do with your clients? You have because they're successful, right? They're already yeah. walking into you successful, right? Exactly. They're, they're successful, but they're not successful. I don't know right. if we, you would like to explain that a little bit, but <laughs> successful but not successful, right? Here's, so, what are, so tell me how we can reboot. How anybody can use the you know some of the things that you teach to reboot crisis. So, it's where your mind, your body, your heart, and your spirit—all of the things that make up you are aligned to support your life, not the other way around where, you know, your job is supporting your life or your community is supporting your life or your relationships are reporting your life. Because I have found that, you know, putting all of that energy into your job and all these external things and into your, often my clients will come to me and like something's wrong and they don't know what's wrong. I, I was on a call this morning saying, I've got a great job. I, I'm, I, I work out all the time and I feel like hell. And like, I just, I don't know what's going on. Can you help me? I'm like, yes, because so unaligned where they get into this world of, of uh, realizing that they've spent all of their time, money, and energy in these external things. And they feel guilty about not spending time uh, uh, with their kids that are now getting older and that guilt, low energy just drags everything else down. You know, it's like, it's, that's that flip. And so I advocate for three changes in thinking. One of them is, and and the most powerful one is to become a citizen scientist to really um, understand what your goals are, where you want to go, and then create small changes, experiment with them, and see if you are getting towards those things. Don't do the big changes, right? but be the, do the small changes. I also ask people to question conventional wisdom. There's so much clickbait on, out on there, like the seven ways to do this, the three ways yeah. to do this, the T, you know, like you've got to eat keto, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And like people, it's confusing. We are in, I mean, the politics alone shows us that we are in this post-truth world. Yes. And like this conventional wisdom means, means like looking at and saying, 
is that absolutely true? Well, no, it may not be absolutely true. So what's going to be true for me, right? And then finally, it's remaining curious. Just the, the acronym C, the, 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 the sleep, the exercise, the, uh, the eating and the noticing, that remaining curious underpins all of this because your practices must evolve over the course of your life. It can't, I, who I was when I was in my 30s is very different than where I'm in my 40s and it's going right. to be different in my 50s and 60s. So your practices will change and evolve. So remaining curious and continuing to learn and starting this lifelong learning about yourself and being able to get at your goals is what happens more than anything else. So for example, my example is my intention this year. I set an intention every year of working on my heart. I, I had had some, some uh, medical stuff unexpectedly show up and, hey, I'm in midlife. You know, it happens. You know, heart disease is the number one thing that kills most people. Mm -hmm. And I also want uh, to work on my metaphorical heart, my romantic heart. And so I set these intentions. And it started with uh, really understanding what heart disease is, um, what, you know, what causes it, what are things that, that are reversible, might not be reversible. That's questioning conventional wisdom because a lot of people say it's not reversible. I'm like, I don't know if that's true. I gathered my team, including you, of like, okay, what is this all about? Deep diving into it. And what are the changes that I can make? And I've started making small, subtle changes and measuring those changes and seeing how it is. And now, Midway through the year, I've made huge leaps and bounds in my personal health by making those small selected changes. And here is the magical, the, the, I'm going to use magical a lot on this, is that uh, my intention of doing my metaphorical, my romantic heart, and my, um, my physical heart, they turned out to be the same thing. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. And yeah. this is where it showed up. I, I got into a, a big, big relationship. I just explosively as I, as, as sort of the world was, was going tipsy turvy. And I lost track of so many of my practices as I was sort of swept up into all of the changes that were going on around me and my romantic heart. So it was sucking the pool water out and I was draining my, 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 uh, my practices. And that started to affect my, my, my physical heart. Yes. And that was the recognition of like, no, I must be aligned. My romantic and my physical heart must go together. And because I stopped paying attention to that relationship as my physical and mental well-being dropped and it did not do well by the relationship. So both of those things have to go together. And that's my biggest lesson to learn this year. So let me ask you a question. So one of the, the challenges with um, a lot of people, a lot of people that highest level people too, is they just don't know what they want. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm always shocked sometimes when you ask somebody, you know, they come to you for coaching. I don't know if you have this happen, but I haven't come coaching, right? And they're, and they're, they're sitting down and, they, and I go, okay, tell me what you what want. And then, and then it's crickets, right? There's no other, they don't know what to say. Brain cramp. <laughs> so what, it, what, it, what, is, what do you see? Because people, a crisis is when you become confused and chaotic and nothing's really working the way your perception says it should be. Yeah. Nothing is as it should be anymore. And you can have everything working outside, but inside you're chaotic. But totally. do you find that people don't know what they want also? All, all the time. Uh, it, it, it's, it turns out to be a, a strangely difficult question. Uh, and when the stakes are higher, when you see it as your life being, mm -hmm. uh, being like the highest stakes, it turns into the biggest brain cramp of like, uh, now getting over that is, I think the, I don't know, uh, is both the hardest and the easiest. If you don't know, then what you want is to know what you want. And that <laughs> yes. is a skill. Yeah. I mean, that truly is a skill. It's made my life yeah. a whole lot friggin' easier. Yep. My life is so much easier because I spent over a year, believe it or not, believe this or not, my friends, I spent over a year deep diving in uh, with very structured practices of figuring out what the hell I wanted because mm -hmm. I didn't know I spent, you know, growing up, you know, my er early formative years were very much about taking care of others 
And that um, practice, that, that way of being was one where my needs were sort of shuttled, you know, to the, to the wind. And I just, I, I, I didn't know what I wanted. And so getting at what you want is the first want. And, and do you find that most, um, so when you're working with successful people, because if I ask David what he wants, super millennial, he wants the new house, he wants all this stuff that you would <laughs> yeah. get, right? But when you hit that midlife crisis age, 39, going in your 40s, on that's, that's the big one is the 39 or the 40s, right? That's, that's what I see now because I always, my coach clients were always in their 50s. Now I see 39, 38, 39, 40 year olds. This is what you're saying is true. They're coming for crisis, right? That midlife. Yeah. Yeah. When you, when they, when they come to you, what are the biggest challenges that they have to get what they want? Do you find that right. it's difficult to switch them or move them? Tell me what you think. Here's, here's what I know over and over again. I know that, that it's, that this is the inquiry. Uh, the, the first is really getting at, um, when you get specific about some of the qualities of what you want, it gets rid of all the crap, right? Like it, it, it cuts through it. The first one, I think you, 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 you touched on it a little bit. One of them is agency, right? If you don't have control over it, I, it doesn't matter, right? It, it, like, it, like I want world peace, you know, unless, you know, unless you're an arms manufacturer, you know, like unless you have like direct control over it, Look, you don't have agency over. Or the number number one I hear is like, I just want my kids to be happy. Well, you know, I'm not a parent, but I but I was a kid, right? <laughs> yes. You know, you know, like I, I you might be a, a miserable friggin' kid, right? And it has nothing to do with your magical parents, right? right. It's just like you just might be as as my friend said to me, he's like, oh, you know, my kid's just being an asshole. And I'm like, yes. And it doesn't have anything to do with him, right? And exactly. raising the kid, he's just like the kid's being a jerk. Uh, uh, so first is agency. It's like, do you have any control over it? The next thing is that often it's so big that you don't know if it's too damn big, you just don't know the first step. So you just spin and spin and spin. So to really get out of this, keep on going for the inquiries. It's what do you want? Or, or you can even soften that a little bit and say, Hey, what would you like? Right. And do you have that agency? Is it sort of discreet? And that, okay, great. If you got that, what's that going to do for you? Like, really, like, what will that do for you? Like, what's the, you know, what, what, you know, like, and then ask that a few times and go from there. It's like, okay, you've got an idea of like, okay, I want this and this is what it's going to do for me. Like, I want the big house and it's going to make me feel like this is great. Got it. How will you know when you have it? Like, how will you know when you actually have what you want? Like, what's the absolute sign mm -hmm. of it? Then dress it up a little bit, you know, give it, give it some reality. Like, when do you want it? Where do you want it? Do you want it with someone else? You know, that's, that's, that's like, okay, now we're starting to put some Christmas tree bulbs on the Christmas tree, right? And this is the one piece that I find cuts through everything and really gets at the reason. The last question is what, if anything, might you lose if you get what you want? That is the limiting belief right there. That is really seeing it's like okay what are you going to lose and are you okay with that and if you get huge. through that that's huge right it's like what do you want what's it going to do for you like for realsies right how are you going to know when you're going to have it where do you want it with whom and then the kicker what are you going to lose like seriously what are you going to because you're going to lose something and i do that i do that with my clients they tell me you what they to. want and then i break it down i go okay to get this, keep going yeah this is what you're going to have to do to get this are you okay doing right. this to get that and yeah. i always say one of the most important things is to know when you have enough mm. when is enough right i want to it's enough right. money enough this enough that because if you know you have enough then yeah. you don't worry about getting anymore and you get out of the want and you can really start living your life. But exactly. it's okay to go after things. I don't sure. think it's wrong with that. But yeah. like, I like what you said, Dave. Why? What is it giving Why? you? What, what is that, what is, what is that going to be when you get it? Because if you think that's going to get you happiness. Yeah. Midlife crisis, a lot of times, is about fighting peace. They just don't totally. know. And they don't, and they built, imagine you built the first half of your life 
on a stage to play a role and create this identity. Then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you get there and you want to change that identity. You want to right. change that role and it's not so easy. Right. And so one of the things I want to tell everybody listening, first of all, before I go into that, what is the type of, of coaching client that you work with? Dave? Because I know you're very selective and you're like me. We are very selective in our coaching clients. What is the type of client that you're working with? So if they want to contact you, that, that you might be the right coach. My world is, is rebooting, reinvention, uh, reimagining your life. Uh, it happens. We'll, 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 we'll just name the crises right now. Health crisis. Often people come to me, it's like, oh, I feel awful. Or I need to, I just had a client uh, graduate who lost over 200 pounds. You know, like that's no kidding, right? And that is, and I know the client. So yeah. that is an incredible. 200 pounds. And, and I'll he, tell you something, that client, one day yeah. we'll talk about that client because that's an amazing story. So amazing. Working with them. Yes. So health crisis, uh, okay. COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. Um uh, job crisis, um, and a About midlife relation, crisis, relationship, relationship crisis, yeah, because yeah. when it, it, it's the same thing with my, with the intention of my heart, when we get down to it, all of those things do come back to you. And I am an expert in rebooting your life. So where you want to change, I've got you. Now go ahead and throw your website out, Dave. It's limitless, L-I-M-I-T-L dot E-S. Sometimes people get a little bit weirded out by that dot E-S. Look, you can just go to davidcc.com and it'll but, redirect you. But that's okay because yeah. we're going to add the link in the show notes. The link Perfect. to the show notes. Well, also what we're doing with, we are going to be doing a mailing through Living Right with Bill Courtright and the Super Millennial is going to do a mailing <laughs> for all our listeners. And we're going to do a, a direct mail because you're offering a, a gift. For everybody and, and and understand Dave is offering this he's not asking you to opt in he's not asking no. for anything he's literally offering you this and it's one of his free ebooks and it's called yawn a human's guide to kick ass sleep and and I don't know what one of the most disruptive things that happen at midlife is yeah. the sleep patterns change Yep. And so do you want to talk a little bit about that book a little bit on there? Just a Well, one, I, I, I put it together especially for you. So this okay, is only excellent. going to, to your audience. Um, I, I, and I excellent. created it just for you. And I think that, and I, and this is why I'm giving it away, right? I spent a lot of time, energy. I've done talks on this. It's because I struggle with my sleep. It's something that I work on. I find more people struggle with it. And yet it is the number one thing that you can do in order to write your personal ship. If you've got your sleep dialed in, so much gets easier and your health improves. So it is my gift to the world and to your listeners. Thank you so much for being on the show again, Dave. I'm sure we'll have you back. We've been, uh, this wonderful interview with Dave Connolly. He is a speaker, author, transformational coach. And we, have to, we will have you on for the new book because I will do your book study. We'll do our yeah. book study with your book. And his new book is going to be called Midlife Magic. So again, I thank you, my friend, so much and, and everything that you do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. That's it for today's show. Our mission here is to create a shift in a planet. You can join us on that mission by simply like, share, subscribe. Links are right below the show. Dave's information is in the show notes. You can connect with him. You can talk to him. We will be sending out the mailing for the book. If you want to get it, if you want, if you want the book, you're already in our mailing list. You're going to get it. There's no obligation. He just wants to help you. The book is called Yawn, A Human's Guide to Kick-Ass Sleep. Only Dave comes up with those titles. As always, until next time, stay inspired.